heard it was sold out, but I see they found you a seat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so that's the piece of music without which we would not be here tonight. Um, I mean, you might be here tonight, but we wouldn't be here doing the same thing as we're doing. That is a prelude from Joplin's opera, Trimonitia. It comes at the top of the third act. And about a year and a half ago, I made a record called Reflections of Scott Joplin Reconsidered, sort of a survey of Joplin's music. And I decided to start the record with that piece because to me, as a classically trained artist, it's really important that Joplin wrote an opera. It's really important that he cared about classical music. And um, somehow the record got into John's hands and it turns out that this little prelude from the act three of Trimonitia, which nobody knows, is something that he knows and cares about a lot. I care a lot about it. That has always been one of my favorite pieces of music. I remember first listening to the first recording of Trimonitia back in the early 80s. And there were certain pieces that got around that you remembered from Trimonitia playing on PBS. But the thing that really got me was that beautiful prelude. And I noticed after a while that nobody seemed to care about it. Nobody seemed to play it. But I thought that really got me into Joplin's head, that it was really worthy of any opera. It says a lot about a lot of things. Yeah. And if I hadn't told you that that was Joplin, my guess is that you might not guess. Um, and I think that when you hear that first in the evening or on the record, it gives you a different perspective, a different pathway into Joplin's music. And that's really important to know because all of the things that he did were built on that. Um, so just quickly, Joplin is born in? 1868. Thank you. Um, he's better with dates than I am. I'm better at piano than he is. It all works out. <laughs> it all works out. <laughs> so his lifetime is just seeing this incredible growth and like speed in America. And when I was doing my research about his life, it really took me aback how much changed, um, you know, in a short lifetime because he, he was not yet 50 when he died. Um, but, you know, he's going, leading up to the turn of the century. America becomes a different place. And he's so representative of that. And his music is so representative of that. And what's really important to me about Joplin's music and so many of the American composers that I love is that meeting point. The, the fact that they are caught at a crossroads and they make something because that's where they live. So here's Joplin growing up in Texarkana, um, you know, which, as you said, there were, it's got yeah. a population of negative seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure, I, I don't remember the details of how his parents had ended up there, but the other person who had ended up there was um, this man who was a German Jewish immigrant who was there as a tutor of a lumberman's, you know, for lumberman's kids. And little Scott Joplin, who is drawn to music from the beginning, who is playing the piano on the in, in the houses where his mother is cleaning, comes to the attention of this this piano teacher, and you know, he instills this love of classical music in this little boy in Texarkana in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, with Joplin, there aren't many photos, and the ones that there are are before people smiled for photography. So he's just looking glumly into the camera, and he's very dead at this point, and you only know so much about him as a person. And so it's easy to think, well, he's this black composer who lived a very long time ago, and isn't that interesting that it was a long time ago and today we live here? That's not it. From 1868, I'm gonna give you another date, to 1917, which is when he died. So much happened during that time. In 1868, Black music is just past the plantation. It's mostly known only to black people. And then other things happen so that by the time he dies, it's in New York City, which is jangling with this new mixed music. But I get ahead of our story. <laughs> well, where should we go next? I think that where we should go next is 1893. Mm -hmm. That's our date. Yeah, it's a good date. <laughs> <laughs> 1893 is the World's Fair in Chicago. And... Um, it's very segregated, but around the periphery of the fair are all these saloons and brothels, and the music that's happening in those places is this new thing, brand new thing, called ragtime. So this is the first time that mainstream America encounters this music, which, as you said, until then had just been, you know, black music, and an explosion happened. It was, it just, you know, caught everybody's ears, and for really clear reasons, um, called a group. 
<laughs> called a syncopated beat, which no one had ever heard before. It was the catchiest music probably ever written. And of course, today you hear a Scott Joplin piece and you think of a, a boat or hat and lemonade and something Teddy Roosevelt said. But that isn't the way it felt then. The kind of the hook of syncopation was something very new. And two of you out there are thinking, there's some syncopation in some classical music. Yeah, a little. But in terms of how much of it there was in ragtime, that was new. Abraham Lincoln never jammed in that way. He knew marches, he knew jigs, he knew parlor ballads, but that's all on one and three. He never moved the way we now think of it as very normal for a person to move. That's what this ragged time was. And it struck people as a kind of electricity. Yeah. There's something about, the, there's a quote that you know about the tapping of the feet. And then there's this thing in the St. Louis Dispatch about how this is just, you know, it's capturing the imagination of civilized people. And it's the devil's music. I mean, it was really shocking and transformative. It was really transformative. There were newspaper reviews that would say, I was surprised to find that my toes were tapping. <laughs> <laughs> Which shows you how new this was. And here Scott Joplin was central in popularizing and as much as one hates to say it, even perhaps refining this yeah. music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then, I mean, the thing that I find so interesting and amusing is that at exactly the same time, so here's this fair I think 2 million people came through the fair that summer. All of a sudden, this is in everybody's ears. It's overnight, because this is also the heyday of publishing. Overnight, there are nice ladies in nice house, houses with nice parlors and nice pianos ordering this music and learning it and probably butchering it. But it's becoming so genteel and so, you know, normalized. Mm -hmm. And it's just what you do at home on a Sunday These afternoon. And they're dancing to it. And there are these dances called things like the turkey trot. And there's a certain kind of lady who's like, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> we're dancing. And so it has become the brand new music, even for Mrs. Anderson and Mr. Terwilliger. Yeah. I don't know where I got those names, but <laughs> those, those people. Is there Mr. Terwilliger in that <laughs> So... Joplin is an itinerant musician. He's playing in bands. He's making a living. Well, you know, he wanted to be a classical composer. That was really not an option at the moment. So he's making a living and he's traveling around a lot. And then this World's Fair happens and ragtime becomes very popular. And in 1899, he's ended up now in Sedalia, Missouri. And he walks into a little shop owned by a gentleman named John Stark who publishes music and sells ice cream. And uh, Joplin has with him the, the sheet music for a new tune of his. And John Stark buys it on the spot. What was the publishing deal? Um, what is it? One cent for every dollar. One cent and then, dollar. and you know, and the sheet music did not cost anything near a dollar. Right. And so it wasn't a good deal. It was not a good deal. Although the music did sell a lot. Yeah. And but so, but still, it did not make it did <laughs> no. not make Joplin a rich man. No. Yeah. But it did earn him the title, the King of Ragtime, which he deserved. Yeah. And here's that tune.
Thank you. That was Maple Leaf Rag. And after that, Scott Joplin was very much in demand. He was. Very much copied, mm -hmm. very much sought after. Mm -hmm. All of the rags that he published after that always said, Scott, by Scott Joplin, the composer of Maple Leaf Rag. Exactly. Yeah, because that was his big one. And he wrote a lot of really beautiful pieces. A lot of them did not sound like that. And he had a sense. I don't get the feeling that those rags were what he thought of as him. It was the other things he was doing, such as the musical theater pieces, and then especially his larger project, mm -hmm. the opera. Yeah. In fact, I want to share something that really shows the other side of him. And um, this is, I do think it's one of the most beautiful things he wrote. It's also one of the saddest things he wrote. Um, Scott Joplin was unlucky in many things. Including his three marriages. Yes. That's right. Yes. Um, this piece dates from the second, which was the unluckiest. I think she was the one. He, that was the love of his life. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, she died six weeks after they were married. Uh, they did not have good medicine back then. And um, this is a piece that he wrote in her memory. It's called Bethina, a concert waltz.
Laura, do you know that um, probably the world's expert on Scott Joplin, Ed Berlin, has found a photo of Freddie? It's interesting. She looked like Kerry Washington. Really? He has found a photo of Freddie in a group shot. Just something I thought I'd throw out there. <laughs> Here's a date. 1892. A lot of stuff happened. Dvorak comes to America. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's so interesting. You know, New York, well, it's a big city, but it's not, you know? And all these different things are coming to pass at exactly the same moment, which have implications, but they don't know about each other, which I guess is called life. Uh, but in the 1892, Dvorak comes to America. He's courted uh, with a lot of money to come and be the director of our first national conservatory. And he's already very famous in Europe. And one of the things he's famous for is using the folk music of his country to, you know, great and beautiful effect and encouraging a lot of other Euro European composers to do the same thing. So he comes here and the story goes that he's in his office at the conservatory and in the hallway is this young student named Harry T. Burley, who is a scholarship student and is also doing odd jobs to, you know, contribute to his um, to his tuition. And he's mopping the floors and he's singing these spirituals. And Dvorak hears these spirituals and the two start talking and the rest is history. And we don't know about the mopping or any of that. But they did connect. And when Dvorak heard this music, he was absolutely and instantly convinced that this was the answer to American music, that this was our folk music, that this should be the root of any classical music that was created in this country. Because until then, all we were doing was, you know, copying what was happening across the ocean. And not only did he believe that and start writing music that proved um, that theory, for example, the New World Symphony, <laughs> Just wanted to remind you. <laughs> go on, go on. That's fine. <laughs> How does it go next? <laughs> but he also starts talking about this. And it's kind of interesting what happens. It gets very controversial very fast um, for some obvious reasons. But you can really look at that moment as a dividing point, I think, in American music and in classical music in general. Because if you imagine what would have happened if everyone had listened to him, then the kind of music that we think of as very American, but we hear it on Broadway or we hear it in the movie, really would have permeated classical concert music, I think, much more than it did. And instead, what happens is that classical music moves on. There are attempts, such as Dvorak's, that get a certain amount of attention. But the main development is seen to be something like Aaron Copland, and the music is beautiful, but... That has nothing to do with the black essence. That's trying to do the cowboy essence that's taken from British folk songs and things like that. That's Aaron, that's Aaron Copeland, the, the, the Jewish son of it. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> really <West>. using his <laughs> roots, his roots <laughs> music. And then you have various kinds of American classical music that you know, were designed to be relatively unlistenable. And all that is very respectful, but... It didn't have anything to do with the root music of America. It had to do with the obsessions of certain people without enough to do. And so the problem was that... I told you I coined a phrase. <laughs> Which one? I call it smart music. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. It was very intelligent. But it had nothing to do with a, an American classical music that really deserved the name in terms of who constituted America. So let's focus on Burley for a minute because I think sometimes Burley gets overlooked in this Dvorak story. So Burley himself was an extraordinary musician. He was an incredibly gifted singer. At one point, he was um, the the head tenor at I can't I can never remember which church was the very fanciest Episcopal church. The Episcopal church, yeah, in Manhattan, and also at Temple Emmanuel. So he was absolutely known by everyone, and he he took Dvorak's words to heart, and he realized that these songs, these melodies, could have could occupy a different space. So he started making arrangements of them. He started bringing them onto concert stages. He was doing arrangements that were sung by the great singers of the day and the next generation. And I have two pieces I'd love to play for you that are from a set that he wrote called From the Southland. Now, he was raised in Erie, Pennsylvania. He, he never went down south, but he's pulling on these, these melodies of the Black South, and he is 
bringing them into concert form. Um, and so you will recognize the melodies here. Uh, one of the pieces is based on um, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. The other is My Lord, When I'm Morning. Harry Burley, the last name is spelled B-U-R-L-E-I-G-H, if you want to look him up. Not Burley as in Ethel Merman. It's Bur it's Burley. It's letting you know.
<laughs> so, you know, th this first, these first two decades, I think, of the turn of the century, they're interesting because we've kind of forgotten about them because everything interesting happened in the 20s. But it's important to think about them because then you understand what happened in the 20s. Yeah. Right? I think people who are living in the aughts and the teens weren't thinking, this isn't as interesting as what's going to happen. <laughs> they thought of themselves as living at the end of time just like we do. And actually, it was a very interesting period. Yeah. Um, and the music that's coming together, right? All these different people coming, but people are moving around. There's transportation. So people are moving around. <laughs> Not medicine, but. <laughs> and, and all these sounds are starting to form. Uh, but you always talk about the tameness of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was an interesting time because... The way Americans heard ragtime was not mainly these beautiful piano pieces that are difficult to play. If you heard those pieces, you probably heard them done in a band arrangement, for one thing. And there was the, the dance ability that that tended to foster, etc. But what happened to ragtime was that it was filtered down into a musically simpler version where the lyrics tended to be rather vulgar and racist ones. There was something called a coon song, and that was the way many people heard ragtime. Or if it wasn't that, then it was tamer kinds of lyrics set to this tamer kind of music, such as Alexander's Ragtime Band. And so this wasn't classical music, but where most people lived, there was this, this stewing that was happening. And that was happening in these boring aughts <laughs> and teens that this new music was coming to exist that everybody listened to. Okay, so we're going to spend a little time in the boring, in the the boring aughts and teens. Yeah. Um, two composers we're going to share with you. James Reese Europe, who was very central to the um, sort of black cultural center of New York. He served in the First World War, Harlem Hellfighters. He was a band leader, composer, and just kind of like the connector of people and things. And also something by Irving Berlin. Mr. Berlin, who was born in Russia and was a, a Jewish individual. Who wrote the best yeah. Christmas song of all time. And basically <laughs> learned how to write American music, and that included the what he would have considered the black element, and he did it very well, and a lot of what people heard as ragtime, therefore, was not maple leaf rag, but the sorts of songs that he wrote. And we're going to hear one of those, too, right? Yeah, you have to come with me. Now. Yeah, is this that part? This is that part. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is a little this is a little song by by James Reese Europe. Very little. At blink and you'll miss it. It's called Good Night Angeline. I'm not really a singer. <laughs> I'm definitely not a singer, but I'm gonna sing it too. It's not in my key. <laughs> Good night, my Angeline. Farewell, my girls so fine. Leaving time is grieving time. Hate to part with baby mine. Nighttime was made for love, and it's the right time for turtle doving. Kisses taste much finer, hugging seems diviner. But I must leave you, honey, cause I'm feeling funny. Good night, Angeline. <laughs> Okay, you're on. <laughs> Who I introduce? Yeah. Not really a piano player either, <laughs> but this is a song that Irving Berlin wrote in 1914. He wrote a whole show of ragtime numbers. It was called Watch Your Step. And you can go through all the numbers, and some of them don't really stand the test of time, but one of them, really, the minute you hear it, you cannot get rid of it. It never developed any kind of reputation beyond its era, and that is a sin. And so I'm going to give you my version of Syncopated Wall because you're not going to hear it anywhere else. So bear with me. I'm going to hold the mic. <laughs> Strange, there's been a change in how the people walk these days. Yes, you must confess that ever since the dancing craze, everybody has a syncopated walk. Where it's in the air, you'll see them swaying as they go. Smile, but all the while, you must admit that it is so, for they do. They do. If 
you don't think it's true, then just watch. Look at him doing it. Look at him doing it. That syncopated walk. Look at him doing it. Look at him doing it. I know who introduced it. Wait till it reaches you. Wait till it teaches you. That syncopated walk. You'll be doing it too. Because it's done by everyone You'll find it's international, that irrational step It's full of pep, it's full of pep And in the morning when they rise For their morning exercise They do that syncopated walk Because it's done by everyone You'll find it's international, that irrational step full of pep and in the morning when they rise to their morning exercise they do that syncopated walk they do that syncopated walk It's okay. I also teach at Columbia, and I write a column for the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> Just have to look at them doing it. <laughs> so that part's over. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best part. Come on. You know that's the best part. All right. So we're now we're through with the boring aughts and teens. So the Exciting. 20s happened. Right. So 1921, this big thing happens. There's a show called Shuffle Along that opens on Broadway. It's by U.B. Blake and Noble Sissel. And who all was in that cast? Josephine Baker. She passed through. Paul, Paul Robeson, Robeson passed through. Yep. Anybody who was a big black performer then did some shuffle along. William Grant Still, the dean of African-American composers, is playing oboe in the pit for shuffle along. And Langston Hughes calls this show the start of, this, of the Harlem Renaissance. It's a huge hit. It had, I think, almost 500 performances. And everyone came to see it. And people came to see it over and over again. It was kind of like Hamilton. And um, it, it was just like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we're talking about, you know, how Irving Berlin sounds in the teens. Mm -hmm. And then it's just this gives people new ideas. You know, when we talk about other composers and I think both of us, we were, we were saying we talk about that time and like all these sounds that are coming together. And you have some image in your head of just like somebody opens the window and these sounds are floating through the air. But no, people are going to experience things that they never have before. And, you know, your ideas change and, you, and new sounds come to you. So um, really, really important, important moment in American music. Yes, yeah, Shuffle Along is the first Broadway score where if, if you're obsessive and you've listened that far back, it's the first one where you don't think to yourself, oh, how charming and quaint. It's the first one where you think, whoa, that's Broadway, that snaps, that's hot. It happened with that particular show. Yeah. And there's this one tune in the show that I have always thought should be an American songbook classic, and it's not. Um, so I am working on that. <laughs> I have this beautiful arrangement. This is a song called Love Will Find a Way. The big hit from the show was I'm Just Wild About Harry. It's nice, but really this song is better. And no one knows it. Ella never sang it, etc. But it's a very important song, and you're going to hear it right here.
Thank you. You know, I want to say something about this sound. So that song didn't sound anything like that in the show. No. Nothing like that. But what I love to do is to capture these things from the past and reposition them. I don't know if anybody heard the broadcast last night with the Berkeley Symphony. Um, that was a concert where I played pieces by Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn. Um, Ellington's New World of Coming, which is in fact a piano concerto, so he's really pulling, you know, on his on his um, presence in the symphonic world. But this suite of songs by Billy Strayhorn, which was commissioned for me by the Boston Pops and the Philadelphia Orchestra, and what we did is we took these three songs by Billy Strayhorn, who had always wanted to be a great classical pianist and composer, and we repositioned them into that space. And I think that we can do that. And and then what we hear is very familiar because we know this blended sound. We know this blended sound from composers like Joplin and William Grant still. And there's so much that's kind of been lost by the wayside because it got parked in history. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to bring it back into this, just like this American sound world, the thing that Duke Ellington called, you know, he said the music was beyond category. There are only two kinds of music, good music and the other kind. <laughs> Laura, I want to interject one thing, which is that that arrangement of Love Will Find a Way is a, a truly gorgeous thing. And But of course, it, it didn't sound like that in 1921. I remember I was listening. Even when you hear it the way it sounded in 1921, I was listening to an LP, this scratchy old thing of the, the recordings of the original performances. And I was like 12, and I was listening to it by accident. My father had put it on by accident. And I'm just kind of listening to these songs. And of course you like, you know, I'm just wild about Harry, you know, uh, an armadillo would like that song. But then there are these other ones that are kind of creaking by and I don't really get it, but that one. And it, it, it's creaking through the ether. And I remember at the time thinking, I like that song. That's a pretty song. And I was an ignorant pre-adolescent and it jumped right out at me. And that is the sort of thing that needs to be preserved. Well, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> um, we're, we're running out of time there's so much to talk about but that's why this is a series of concerts and you can come to the next one um, but just it's worth thinking about this so one of the people who went to see Shuffle Along George Gershwin you know and then what happens a few years later he comes up with this little <laughs> not through the open window. This is because people came together and they shared their ideas and they shared their music. And that's a really beautiful thing. Um, to close, we would like to go back to our, our beginning premise this evening. So I will share with you why I care about Joplin. Um, so I'm a really little girl and my mom did this thing that she called homeschooling, which meant taking us to double matinees at the Castro Theater. <laughs> <laughs> And so we saw all these old movies, and one of them was The Sting. And um, so first you fall in love with Paul Newman, and then, you know, there's this music, and the music was so fun, and the best thing was that my piano teacher actually let me play it, which was a nice break from the Bach and the Mozart that was, you know, happening so intensely at that time. So I played The Entertainer, just like maybe all of you, and I probably played it okay, because, you know, I had the Bach and the Mozart. But remember how everybody played The Entertainer so badly? <laughs> like, so badly? So we would love to um, close this evening by doing exactly that. John. <laughs> <laughs> remember the finger I had Yes. <laughs> I'm not really a piano player. <laughs> 